All right, so straight to our, our panel question. Um, our question will be this. We'll try to keep this to about 10 minutes and then we'll move on. So we are living in an upside down world where the media should be the government watchdog. It's become the government lapdog. We are living in a world where the misinformation artists have become the gaslighters. Fooled the public, the public is walking around. We're, we're essentially living in a world where you know, I believe the way this turns around is through the court of public opinion. That's when our politicians will listen. But how do we do that when we have so many people indoctrinated and brainwashed into the propaganda that's being fed? So, um, again, adverse events coming in a tidal wave that even mainstream doctors who are not aware of what's happening cannot close their eyes to. It's going to be in their face. We have the World Health Organization and the pandemic treaty, the amendments to the IHR. We have digital surveillance digital cash coming, everything looking to lock us down through climate change. I want to ask each of the panelists, um, and feel free, whoever would like to start, what do you think is the thing that people should really focus on right now in terms of the way the world is going and how we are going to make a difference? Nice, easy topic. <laughs> Left to right. Yeah, so I, 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 again, I don't know this, the mo most important, but something that I think is very important uh, very, very important is looking after your own health and trying to look after your own health as naturally as you possibly can. So I just like to use this as an opportunity. I didn't get to, to um, say something like correct some serious misinformation that was recently released in Canada. So I'll, I'll do it now. Um, and I agree with Dr. Palmer. The time has come where some people just need to be called out and be held accountable, especially for the things that they're saying. So uh, Mr. Timothy Caulfield has, has been dubbed somehow Canada's guru on misinformation. Uh, and it seems to me, I didn't know about this guy before, but many members of the public uh, brought, brought him to my attention and I've reviewed his messaging. And it seems to me that he's crossing the line with academic misconduct by blocking uh, reasonable Canadians who are trying to have a discussion with him. So he, uh, just so you understand, he, he just recently got the Order of Canada for his work on, on rooting out misinformation, um, health-related health, health -related misinformation. Now, I just want to highlight that so, you know, to Timothy Colville, that that's hard to get, so congratulations, but I can't help but feel that it is somewhat like a, giving a, a sheriff their badge, right? And enabling him then, sort of empowering him to call it whoever he wants. And he's blocking members of the public when they're trying to have discussions with him. I can understand blocking if somebody's sending death threats, for example. And, and, and for the average person, their social media accounts are personal, right? You can claim that's your personal time, but you need to understand, he has received hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayer funds specifically to work on social media, to disseminate to the public, to clarify for the public what is and what is not misinformation. So that is his workplace. That is, and he's a public servant and he's getting paid as a faculty member to work in places like the Twitter space. He, he doesn't have the right to block reasonable Canadians trying to engage in discussions. So he recently on CBC News was interviewed just a few days ago and this is a remarkable thing. It appears he's a lawyer, he has a law degree. He doesn't have an MD, he doesn't have a PhD, he's not a scientist, but somehow he knows everything about every science there is. He's soon gonna be presenting to a bunch of farmers in London coming up. Mr. Caulfield, if you'll talk to me there, if you wanna invite me there, I'll, I'll join you there. Uh, he's gonna have a conference, the first national conference on uh, misinformation for Canada coming up in March in Montreal. Mr. Caulfield, if you would like me to be a speaker there, I'd be happy to. But what you have to understand is, in this interview, so he, he knows immunology, virology, agricultural sciences, food science, everything. So he gave an interview and it was called Immune Boosting Orange Peels. And it horrified me. They made fun, the CBC reporter, shame on them. They made fun, uh, they pulled up random uh, YouTube videos and then for him to comment on. One was this lady making a drink from orange peels and explaining how they're super rich in vitamin C, right, and all this. And so afterwards he was asked, like, is this fake science, right? And she talked about how it can boost your immune system. And he, he said no, uh, that it wasn't, right? They made fun of this lady. Um, he, he, and then he, he pointed out, when asked about this immune boosting, he actually had the gall to say, this is what he said, immune boosting causes things like, uh, anaphylaxis, right, which is life-threatening, you know, reactions to things, and autoimmune diseases, right? That's what he said. If you boost the immune system, it causes anaphylaxis and autoimmune diseases. Mr. Caulfield, as, a, as an immunologist, that is completely false. And if you haven't seen, he constantly bashes natural products to maintain health. I have two things to say, Mr. Caulfield, about that comment and to clarify for all Canadians. First, 
he, when you talk about uh, these things not being poor, so for example, this verse was talking about vitamin C. Has he not heard of scurvy? Vitamin C is a critical component of the immune system. I think what he's misunderstanding is there's such a thing as having optimal concentrations of all of these things that the immune system needs to function optimally. That's vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, all these things you've been hearing about. If you don't have optimal concentrations in your body, your immune system is not going to function optimally. The most metabolically active physiological system by far in the body is the immune system. The only cells that can, that can compete and outcompete the growth rate of cancer cells are cells of the immune system when they become activated. Our vitamin D requirements in Canada, where we're in northern climates, most people, most Canadians are vitamin D deficient, yet we declared vitamin D. I didn't. Patty Hadju, our Minister of Health, declared vitamin D fake science during this pandemic. And, and Timothy Caulfield goes at it hard. Um, you gotta have to understand, most of us are deficient. It's a critical cog, right, for the immune system. And you need to understand, you, th this is good science, all right? So, Mr. Caulfield, without enough vitamin C, you get scurvy. Yes, you don't have to push the doses. Once you're at a maximal concentration, an optimal concentration, your immune system is gonna function optimally. But this is important, because Mr. Caulfield, if you have two populations, and one has, generally has suboptimal functioning immune systems, and the other population has been educated to have optimal functioning immune systems, that latter population is going to be a much healthier population, experiencing much less disease overall. So stop attacking these things. And the other thing is, you've caught yourself between a rock and a hard place, Mr. Caulfield, because when you said that immune boosting causes an, all it causes anaphylaxis, and autoimmune diseases, do you not realize that you're pushing the booster shots? And hello, what do you think those are doing? A vaccine is specifically designed to boost an immune response, quite substantially so. So you're not caught between a rock and a hard place. Which lie was it? Were you lying about the vitamin C and vitamin D and all other supplements that are important for optimal immunological functioning? Or are you lying about the boosters that you're pushing on our children? Either way, I've caught you spreading misinformation. And I just want to point out for the sake of our reporter here, or a journalist, a real journalist, I, have, I mean, the journalist just sat there and said, oh, that tea sounds yummy, but is, it, you know, is this real science? And of course, that's what he came up with. So when he said that, why didn't she immediately jump on him? But you have been pushing these boosters on everybody. That's immunological boosting. So are you telling Canadians that those immunological boosters that you're pushing cause anaphylaxis and autoimmune diseases? The answer is yes in some people. You know, but he's got to think about that. So that's the message I wanted to get out for the sake of the health of Canadians. Look after your own health. You can't trust people anymore. Look, maximize your own health. Optimally functioning immune systems are mean you're going to have to depend less on pharmaceutical companies and their drugs and vaccines. I wonder, I wonder Glenn, would this constitute misinformation to the folks we're talking to? This orange is safe and effective. <laughs> It sounds true. <laughs> um, I would say the only thing that we can save, that, that can save us is ourselves, much like what Byram just said, is your health is your, your own responsibility. We enjoy a robust democracy for now, although it feels like it's crumbling. The system is still in place, and we have elections, and you can participate in it. Get out there and participate in it. Maybe run for office. Maybe call your parliamentarian and tell them very specifically, I would like to meet with you with a group of people, a group of business people, whoever they are, in your constituency, and I'd like to discuss some of these things that we've been hearing and bring them facts and say, I'm not going to tolerate a World Health Organization pandemic treaty telling me I can't go outside unless I get vaccine number 17. Tell them these things and say, I want you to stand up or I'm going to find somebody who will. Now, unfortunately, the Liberals aren't going to do anything. The NDP are dating the Liberals right now, so they're not going to do anything. So you're left with the Conservative Party. And I have great hope. I don't have trust, but I have hope for their leader and what they're saying they're going to do for us. And I think it is absolutely critical. I've been nonpartisan my entire life. I've joined all of the political parties just to see, because it's 10 bucks, and just because I get all their emails now, right? <laughs> Even though I unjoined the Liberals because I thought it made me happy one day to say, I am not going to pay another dime until the Prime Minister stands up and calls genocide by its name in the House of Commons when everybody else came and he told them, don't come, because I lived in China and I know what they're doing to the Uyghurs and you don't have to live in China to know that. And he wouldn't come when they said, we're going to call this genocide. 
And I told people, people, why are you so angry with this? And I said, because if he won't call genocide by its name in China, expect to find it here under his rule. Something about him doesn't mind it. So get on the phone, get on the email, tell all your friends, don't stop. Mayor, MPP, MP, do it to all the parties and all the time because that's the only way they're gonna hear us. Great answers. Um, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I guess looking back on my experience through all of this, um, I do really feel like we're in a real spiritual war. We're surrounded by so many people and entities that thrive off of fear, anger, rage, and division, right? And, and so sometimes it can be tempting to kind of fall into that and try to fight back at them, but sometimes that actually gives them so much more energy. But from what I've found, like what led me to speak out, what led me to kind of take these decisions compared to other doctors that, that didn't, you can, you can hear it often what they say, well, I have to save my career, I need to save my license, I need to put food on the table. And looking back, like my meditation practice of just kind of looking at who am I, who, what is the universe, what is this place that we're living in, and awakening to the fact that not so much that we're these little human beings that can be battered around by a government or, or a medical college that just wants to, to hide the truth. But when we realize that we're actually a, a, an immortal soul just having a human experience, you realize that you have so much more power than, than you realize. And it's from that space that you can take risks, that you can not just risk your career, but risk your career when you literally have no idea what you're gonna do next. <laughs> and because those coming from that space is where you can make those decisions that can really change things because you're not controllable, you're not predictable, you're not just acting necessarily in your own interest. When you realize that you're actually an invulnerable soul that, that isn't subject to all of these things, and you're not really even afraid to die, that's, it's from that space of, of knowing that uh, your true nature, that we re you really can create change. And that's often where we've seen big movements happen. Uh, if you look at uh, like South Africa or India, when people put, they realize their, their true nature, they, they're willing to put things on the line and fight for something um, uh, in a really powerful way. So I. As much as it seems kind of benign, I do think meditation, just looking at, your, at yourself, your own soul, that goes a long way because from that place, you'll take inspired action that creates change in ways that you can't always predict. And so I, I, I do encourage people to kind of look at their spiritual life, even in their, on their own, because I do believe that's probably the most powerful thing. And somebody out of this crowd, in some way, will create enormous change in ways that you that you wouldn't think when you let go of that fear and you really come from a place of love. All right. I got more than the orange. So maybe I, I'll throw two things. One is when you look at real causes of suffering and disease and death in terms of our health, you find that it's about 70% from reversible causes that can be reversed by us unlearning the, the, the bad teaching that has happened since the Rockefellers invaded healthcare and made it sick care and, came, and turned it from nutrients to poisons. So we need to learn how to take care of our health. And even if you feel like, well, I don't want to take my health, eat natural. There's details upon details, just like martial arts. You know, you get your yellow stripe, and I don't want to go like this, this, but there's a long way to the blue belt and the black belt. So we need to really advance taking care of the most valuable thing each of us has in this world individually, which is our body. We need to exit the WHO. We need to prosecute the medical regulators that, that are imposing this, because the WHO is the conduit into the country. But in the end, it's the medical regulator that is hand on the people's throat, saying, you're not going to see a doctor who ain't going along with this, right? So I think those are really big things. And then a, a, another big thing is decentralized. See, they're all about centralized. They centralize finance with this fake stuff that they call money, this fiat currency, that they just magically make it out of air and then loan it to our governments, and we pay interest on money they made up for us. 
That's insane. And we need to de decentralize information, which is exactly what we're doing. You don't, I don't, you don't need to be certified by this, this, or this to know something that's smart, right? There's a lot of smart people. I got buddies that are farmers that know more about stuff than almost anybody I know. So decentralized knowledge, decentralized finance, decentralized information, decentralized healthcare, right? And decentralized governance. You know, and this is a project that at the World Council for Health, we're gonna work on a lot, which is decentralized. The World Health Organization is top-down organization, right? The vision that we're working with is in the end, you know who is the final council at the top of the ladder in your healthcare and your healthcare? is you. You're your own council for health at the top. Below that, you have your provincial, your federal, you got your world council. We're at the bottom. That's at the bottom, right? So I think decentralization is, is, a, is a big thing. And in, in the area of finance with decentralization, I'm no expert, but there's a big difference between, I know there's a big difference between Bitcoin and all the other cryptos and the digital and all the currencies, the, the cryptocurrencies governments are trying to make. There's a big difference. But a little bit of copper, a little bit of silver, a little bit of gold, some Bitcoin, you've actually got decentralized economy that doesn't bring the banksters who really are at the top of this whole thing is the banksters. I just wanted to say that in my, in my career since journalism, I've been to several hundred medical conferences and I find that there's a confluence between science and language in medicine that is perfect in this man. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Old country doc. Well, I think definitely the decentralization is something that we need to see happen. We're seeing the FDA and even Health Canada now allowing pharmacists to start to diagnose and prescribe medicines for people with COVID. I mean, they are taking away the medical bag of doctors. They are, again, creating these top-down dictates. They're gonna be able to control this through the World Health Organization and whatnot. But the theme I'm hearing here right now is that people need to reinvest themselves in themselves, take responsibility for their lives. I mean, me, when we talk about a spiritual awakening, I used to sit there in the beginning and call people normies and sheep that were following these things, not being able to see through the fact that, you know, Tam and New and all these people sitting there in the beginning in March 2020 were saying, listen, you need to, for the rest of Canadians' sake, save lives and sit six feet, I mean, be six feet apart. Meanwhile, they're two feet apart, right, at these <laughs> press conferences. And, but as I started to do this journalism thing, I just realized we need to be objective. So I stopped calling them sheep. I stopped calling them uh, normies and realized, you know what? These are people who are now victimized by a mechanized, weaponized system that we live in that's completely captured every system of government, uh, organizations, uh, all of our media, and you know the, the list goes on and on. It's just incredible what you guys showed here tonight. Um, moving forward, I think one big problem that we're seeing now is also the, the proliferation of mRNA vaccine technology. Uh, we know that it's going to be taking over all the traditional vaccines. We know that if you go to the U.S. clinical trials government website in the U.S., there's over 100 now that are in the pipeline. Dr. Bridal, you've talked about the fact that it's going to get into our food species, create oral tolerance. You also wrote about the fact that the University of California is now actually trying to put uh, the mRNA vaccine technology uh, vector technology into lettuce where people can grow it in their own farms and therefore self-dose. Can you tell us, you know, is it going to be inescapable? We have shedding as an issue. What do you think is the future of, you know, and, and let's not forget the fact that there are geneticists that are talking about the fact we're seeing the vaccine, uh, mRNA, the, the, the RNA inside the nucleus. We're seeing uh, SARS-CoV-2 already integrated into human genomes, right? What do you see? Is there an escape from this technology, this Frankenstein that's gone out of control? What are you looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> the only one unqualified to answer that question on the same panel. <laughs> Trust Rodney. I'll, 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 warm, I'll warm up the subject a little bit, if you like, unless you got something. I, I think I already <laughs> forgot what I was going to say. Well... I think this comes down to very, very basic question of what are our rights and who gives us our rights. So I didn't want to live in a war, but I do live in a war, right? So it's a bit like a fight. Like, if you don't want to get in a fight. Well, neither do I. But when somebody grabs you by the throat, 
what do you do? Well, what if somebody else says, well, don't you dare hit them back? Well, they got me by the throat. When somebody's trying to kill your kids and sterilize you, what do you do, right? Now, none of us are claiming to have all the answers. I mean, we're certainly not in denial. But I think we all have to get very creative. And it doesn't matter if, I mean, now, I mean, we know at least 10% of the population is waking up. So we only got 4 million Canadians. That's a heck of an army. And, and if we can learn throughout this movement, and I think we have, I mean, you feel a lot of love in these events. And lately, there's been some, we could call them ripples in the force, and some of this infighting. And I'll tell you, what I think that is, is you get tired of three years of trying to fight a giant, so you go, you know what, why don't we just punch each other out, <laughs> right? And that's what's happening, and we need to resist that urge. Like, we need to be with each other, which is almost everybody, like super, super loving beings. But with the enemy, we have got to crush them. We have got to eliminate them. And we can, it's in a fight, you know, you throw a kick, you throw a punch, you try a choke, you do a lot of stuff, right? So we gotta do a lot of stuff. So, sure, do you need doctors and scientists and journalists? Yeah, do you need lawyers? Yeah, do you need activists? Yeah, do you need police? Yeah, do you need investigators? Yeah, do you need military? Yeah, do you Citizen need Citizen journalists? Yeah, all of it. So, I said you first. Well, I'm talking about anybody who goes out yeah. there with their cell phone. I mean, yeah. you know. So I think we have to be really creative, but you just have to draw a line. Like dying and losing is just not an option. So, and, and another thing is to realize that there's a lot of us. I mean, there's at least 4 million Canadians that went through everything you had to go through to not get injected with the goop even once. That wasn't easy. You'd be, people stood out in the cold and watched their friends have dinner. Right? And then you've got, you've got the, I think we're at the majority of Canadians saying, I ain't taking any more of that. So why do we feel like the minority? Why are the, we the ants who are afraid of, was it the grasshoppers or who was it in that movie, Ants? We're, we are the majority. And even if we weren't the majority, a million is enough. Four million is more than enough. So we got we to gotta take it back. I don't have all the answers, but between the bunch of us, we do. So decentralized intelligence, keep loving each other, but don't give the enemy any ground. I mean, if people are trying to kill you, I gotta be honest, they're not in the membership, they're not in the human race, and they're not getting any love for me. So, uh, yeah, first I was gonna say, Glenn, getting uh, physicians outside of their clinical practice and scientists to keep things brief is like herding cats, <laughs> as you've learned in every other journalist. So, um, uh, but, but I do want to say something about the mRNA, mRNA vaccine technology. So this was, a very, this was a big concern of mine right from when I discovered that these things were being distributed throughout the body. I saw the potential for shedding. That then for me, a landmark scientific study uh, came out, or data from a study came out, um, and it showed evidence of the mRNA from these vaccines getting into breast milk. But unfortunately, it was a preprint article. To this day, it's still a preprint article. It hasn't actually been published. And so I'm very careful that I don't go forward with strong messaging when, if I don't have good, solid, peer-reviewed scientific evidence to back it up. Um, I would argue that you know, these, these preprint papers, they can give us a heads up of the data that's coming, but they don't stand up well in court, for example. Um, so I waited until the recent publication showing these mRNA vaccines getting to breast milk. That was all I needed. It would have been so easy to look at this, uh, Pfizer had in their preclinical studies collected all of the samples required to look at potential shedding, and they archived them all. They never, they never conducted the study. My laboratory, if we had those samples, could have that data within a week. It's very easy to do, especially for a giant with, uh, like Pfizer and the resources they have. Um, but so if it gets in the breast milk and can get fed, therefore, to babies, that, that's shedding. That's, that's the vaccine leaving the body and being able to be picked up by somebody else. And so, yeah, that's when I went public. And the first person I talked to actually was Glenn. Um, and boy, that interview, <laughs> again, I got accused of misinformation. But th this is the point. If it can get into human breast milk, uh, there's no reason if we're injecting these things into, into dairy cattle, for example, that it might not get into cow's milk, right, or goat's milk, or into the eggs of, of chickens. And, and this, this is a very real concern. And so one, one of my concerns with that, so first of all, if we do take up the lipid nanoparticles, those lipid nanoparticles are designed to fuse with our cells because our cells are covered in layers of fat as well, and they can deliver their contents. Um, one of my major concerns, though, is, is 
it, it, and the influenza vaccine is a good example. And in fact, that was discussed tonight, right? Some of the things that people are most scared about when it comes to the flu is it recombining, you know, swine flu recombining with human flu and avian flu recombining with human flu, right? So swine influenza and, and uh, or avian influenza, yeah, and swine influenza. And that 2009 uh, pandemic declaration, right, right, was swine influenza. So the idea is, and it was great because Dr. Phillips talked about One Health, and this is where it all gets integrated. So the idea is you vaccinate our agricultural species to try and promote hum both their health, but also human health. So that's why I like to use the influenza one as an example, because there's a direct interface there. So these companies are developing mRNA vaccines for the flu. Uh, they're developing dual purpose vaccines to target both SARS-CoV-2 and the flu. Uh, and there's lots of mRNA vaccines being developed for the flu uh, to, tar to give to poultry. So chickens, turkeys, et cetera, and uh, pigs. And that the idea is, okay, if they don't get the flu, then we can't end up with a swine influenza outbreak or an avian influenza outbreak. But yet yeah, we, we absolutely don't know. Like again, everybody, you know, the people, people have not been allowing these studies to be done. Uh, they've been ignoring this, but the data has started to come out. And if these things are getting widely distributed throughout our bodies, why would we expect any different in the agricultural species? So if they get into the, if it gets into the muscle, you know, the meat that we consume, the milk that we consume, the eggs that we consume, et cetera, uh, this could be very problematic. And one of the things I just like to point out is your immune systems, it's designed, you were designed to not respond to what you eat. Imagine if you mounted an immune response every time you ate something. It's foreign. It's not, you know, it's not part of your body, right? An egg, a chicken egg is not, you know, a component of your body. Um, it's foreign. But our immune system doesn't respond to things that just because they're foreign. It responds to things that are foreign and dangerous. And it de So one of the roots that your immune system is educated to say that something, okay, it's foreign but not dangerous is if you eat it, if you consume it, right? Because uh, you don't want chronic food allergies. You don't want to have chronic inflammation in your gut. Uh, like Crohn's disease, for example. And so it's a way to tolerize. And if we start tolerizing ourselves, if we, don't, if we aren't careful, and we start consuming pathogenic proteins, like the key target antigens on influenza, and we start tolerizing ourselves to these things, guess what? When we get exposed to the flu, our immune system is not gonna be primed to respond. It's going to have been educated that you see this thing, it's not dangerous, don't respond. And we'll have more severe disease than ever. This is theoretical at this point, but it's all based on sound science. And again, as a scientist, I'll stand up early and say this, despite people saying, where's the scientific evidence? There's lots of evidence for the building blocks that lead to this potential problem. And as a scientist, that's what I go with, right? We come up with, is this a plausible problem? Is it a potential problem? And if it is a potential problem, then you have to do the research to determine whether it is or is not. And I'm open to the idea that maybe it isn't. But that research has to be done to assure us that these things aren't going to be a problem. So we can't ignore this fact. And just out of interest, so I learned tonight from uh, one of the attendees that these mRNA vaccines, my understanding was they had only been in veterinary clinical trials, but I found out that, that uh, porcine or pigs have been getting mRNA vaccines in the past that companies gave to farmers. And uh, that's one of the ways they got around this. Um, and then also Robert Malone in a recent substat confirmed that. So, you know, we got to be very careful with technology. So I would say I see a lot of people who are taking up a real interest to try and become much more self-sufficient in terms of their food supply, growing a lot more of their own food. Fantastic, thank you. So in the interest of time, we're going to move right to the Q&A, and we've got some pointed questions. Thanks for everybody for your Q&A. Unfortunately, we can't get to everything. Um, this one will point to Dr. Trozzi. Um, if and when the need arises, which country would you relocate to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, if, if Alberta becomes a country, Alberta, uh, wouldn't mind sticking around here and helping found the Federation of Ontario. Um, I, I, I guess, you know, I mean, that's sort of a question, like when you're a lifeguard, and that's, I mean, this whole scam, this whole abuse, they used medicine. You know, medicine was the hack into global tyranny. And, and so, unfortunately, that was my line of work. So, obviously, I had to do something about it, just like my colleagues, you know. Um, so, you kind of, the global agenda uh, is global. So, right? So we can run around looking for where to stand our ground, but the bottom line is we have to take the whole cake. Like this isn't, 
a thing that, you know, if we just get in our corner and avoid them and, you know, like we've got to take back the world. We've got to reestablish what our ancestors fought for, right? One way or the other. I don't have all the answers. I'm just a doctor. But um, so that makes me reluctant to say, well, you know, I'd run here. You know, like it, when the Roman Empire fell, well, if you headed east, you got some hundred more years. Well, this thing's happening way quicker than that, right? I mean, in terms of health, bizarrely, the healthiest place to be right now is Africa. Because Africa, despite them shooting presidents and killing presidents that stood against us, the African people have taken their shoulders back. They haven't been injected. They don't have COVID of any significance. If they do get COVID, despite dictators telling them otherwise, the doctors treat it and it's easy. It's so easy to treat. I mean, like two bucks worth of medicine, ivermectin, aspirin, maybe a little corticosteroid or an antihistamine. I mean, it's a joke, really. It's not hard to treat COVID. Um, so, you know, you'd be tempted to, tempted to, to say Africa. Um, but, you know, I got children, grandchildren, people love. Like, I'm not, I'm not ready to give up the ground here. I think we should hold our ground, and I think we should fight. That brings a lot of comfort to a lot of people. Um, Dr. Phillips, speaking about the WHO pandemic treaty, the IHR, how will they enforce the policies, and do you know, how do we find out who it is? There's one representative per country that needs to make this decision, this vote for all of Canada. Are we able to find out how they'll be able to enforce the policies and who these people are that represent each country? Yeah, in general, at the World Health Assembly, it's the Minister of Health who's shown up there. They usually have a meeting. It's usually just a couple day meeting that they have. So uh, they have like a G7 meeting and then the World Health Organization, the World Health Assembly. So it's the Minister of Health is the one. But how do they enforce it? Um, yeah, so they're pretty vague in the documentation itself, which is why they haven't had a lot of weight. But this is one of the things that I kind of looked into, and I was interested in it because you can see a lot of smaller countries, they're very adamant on following WHO protocols, whereas places like Canada or the US kind of have our own. And I think it really ties back to those other organizations uh, within uh, the UN uh, about how they pull their strings uh, at exerting their power. So. A lot of countries, small countries, uh, especially in Africa or other places, um, are deeply indebted to uh, entities like the International Monetary Fund. And if you do a little deep dive into some of that, it's pretty scary what they do. Like they demand assets, they uh, put in regulations that promote their companies that are like that are special interests and everything like that. So, anyway, those are the countries that they can pull strings in, right? Because they're basically indebted and owned uh, by these organizations. They're going to be pulling as well, uh, they're standardizing these vaccine passports and that the WHO is setting their protocol as the standard. And, that, and because they have the International Civil Aviation Authority as well, uh, they will be able to determine who's allowed to travel and not. So if there's a country that's not compliant with the pandemic protocols, they're not allowed to travel. And that will be determined not by that country or any other country, but by the WHO. So those are just a few of the strings that they can pull, because they have this big network of, uh, of agencies that regulate a lot of things. World Trade Organization, they, they regulate uh, the trade of pharmaceutical products uh, internationally, uh, as well as the trade of animals and food. And so they have the ability, surprisingly, to block those things or to sanction uh, any kind of international uh, trade. Um, so I think that's how they're going to end up pulling these strings um, uh, if a country doesn't comply. Unelected officials, yeah. incredible. Um, Mr. Palmer. Can you, somebody's asking, they actually think this is a, a fantastic uh, request. Is it, is it possible for you to put out a report on and comment on public fact checkers, reporters, um, investigative supposed journalists, and their credentials and funding? For me to put out a report? Yeah, is there somewhere that you could list this? I don't know, I, I guess what they're looking for, some well, sort of accountability. Well, it's more complex than what I've done. So right. um, what, I, what I presented tonight, I started a week ago. And after the first 24 hours of looking into it, my head just about imploded. And I had stuff to do, which I didn't do all week because I was doing this 
for you. And Thank all you. Of you. Um, so the, it's so deep and so broad. These fact checkers will all be traceable back to whoever those organizations are I was talking about. Um, it's, it's, it's complete. The takeover is complete. And it, it arrived fully formed and instantaneously and not without planning. So it's gonna take more than me, because I'm never the smartest person in the room, to figure out how we get to the very top of this. And the answers will all be the same. Whoever it is at the World Health Organization, whoever it is running the Canadian government, whoever it is running all the new, it's the same people, because it's the same message. So we just have to get to the top of that and then convince people that it's wrong and it's not in their interest. But I don't know that, that me, you know, leaving my life behind for another month to, to put out a, a, a solid report on this, although maybe I can get one of them grants from that one organization that has <laughs> handed them out Bright Light News is handing out grants for real Well, news. Bright Light News should be given a grant, I think, because for doing stuff like this, and I don't go around talking about this stuff because I don't think anybody wants to hear it and I got other stuff to do. But Glenn Jung is so amazing at his adopted career of COVID journalist that, and I thought the interview that he did with me was excellent uh, from his perspective and other ones. And so uh, I've, I've seen others uh, that he's done and they're with, with Byram and with, with Robert Malone and they're excellent because you know what he does? The journalists don't do anymore, he listens and lets his subject and that is a lost art, or an art that's been erased, um, where you gotta scream anti-vaxxer at them when they talk. Uh, so I think that uh, no would be the answer, um, to be honest and blunt, but I do think that uh, if you can run a Google machine, you can do what I just did up here, right? You can keep that's looking, keep looking, keep looking, and if it, if it, if it looks like it ain't right, it ain't right. I just want to say after that interview that we did, I, I said, listen, I'm not a journalist. You, are, you have incredible credentials. Can you give me one piece of advice? He said, no. He was, just keep doing what you're doing. It's like, it's not the there answer was I was no looking for. for improvement but, that I yeah, saw. Yeah. <laughs> um, last question we're going to say uh, for Dr. Bridal. Uh, in light of the recent video that was leaked about Pfizer, I was wondering how you suggest addressing pushback on its validity. For instance, Newsweek fact checkers questioned the truth of Pfizer's lab tests and gain-of-function research. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I saw that video. I, I wrote, I, I started doing my own investigation on it, and I, I was able to convince myself that it was valid enough that I wrote a Substack article on it. Uh, and again, I like to be careful with the messaging that I put forward. Um, I've also put out the message that if, if anybody can prove definitively that it, you know, it, it, it was fake in some way, I'm happy to retract stuff. I, I've changed my mind through it. I, I don't realize I have been a scientist that's followed the science. I've changed my mind a lot on things uh, during the uh, pandemic. A lot of people don't realize I, I was, you know, I started off, I was happy with the early treatment strategies being slammed because I'm a vaccinologist, but then the science I saw so many poorly designed studies that made no sense to me. That's actually what caused me to initially start, like, you know, was a yellow flag for me. Uh, and I switched my stance completely. So, you know, on some of these things. So I, I do think it's valid. Certainly, I, I absolutely trust the people who, uh, you know, the, the, the Veritas project. I, I absolutely trust them. The big question is whether this guy, you know, was legit. Uh, but there's clear evidence that the Internet was rapidly scrubbed of a lot of information about this guy. I see no reason to question the documents that were put forward that were claimed to be internal documents. I did try and consult with other people. Um, I, I trust Robert Malone 100%. Uh, I, I contacted uh, Mike Eden, who's a former vice president of Pfizer. Um, unfortunately, since he left in 2011, he told me he could, you know, could neither confirm nor refute the validity. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think it matters so much even what this person's position is. They, they you know, I, for many of us, I don't think the messages that came out were all that surprising. I just think it's great that here's somebody who strung them all together, right? And again, in their words. And to me, the, the, the really compelling thing is, you know, the, the, again, the onus isn't on us, right? The, the, the accusation hasn't been made against us. 
there, was, there were accusations in there made by Pfizer. To me, Pfizer has to answer that. To me, there's got to be some kind of, I don't know, I'd like to see you know, lawyers, that's my, not my area of expertise, but be able to get access information, I don't know, through some kind of discovery, you know, through, through a court case or something. Uh, also, public health agencies have to be held accountable, right? There were some major accusations against them. And, and so to me, they should be held to account to, to prove that this, what this guy said is wrong or that he was lying. Um, you know, he said it's a revolving door, and we've seen it's a revolving door. The number of examples of people who are high up in these regulatory agencies who then go on to uh, cushy positions with Big Pharma and then sometimes come back and then go back to Big Pharma again. There's great examples in the United States. And I, I did my own research. So again, I, I, I didn't realize how naive I was when it came to the clinical sciences because I was more, I've been more involved with preclinical science. And so I investigated Health Canada. And I had always assumed that Health Canada surely must be paid uh, out of tax dollars, right, to serve the public if you're going to serve the, serve the best interests. Well, it's very clear. It's very easy to find that they, the majority of their income comes from the very uh, companies that are submitting applications to them and asking for their approval. Uh, and, I, and I looked, and you can find the fee schedule. So there's a, it keeps going up. So actually, this year now, it's gone over half a million dollars that these companies have to pay for each application and each new indication that they want for you know, their vaccine or, or a drug you know, as, a new, as a new application. So they're paying these half a million dollar fees and I was looking at it from that perspective. It's interesting. The first time, it sounds like it's being run like a business. So the first time is a freebie. First time a company come, a new company with their first application, they don't charge. And that seems to be to me like, and so what, what are the chances then that you're going to give a negative review? That's not going to be a return customer. I don't like the way it's set up. And then they have it so that if you're, you're, they have to make a decision within six months, and if they don't, they've got to give back a huge proportion of that fee. Uh, I think it's 25%, and 25% would be the annual salary for one of their scientists to conduct those reviews. So I'll, I, I would love to see internally what happens if a scientist is running behind, if they say, I haven't been given enough information, I want more information, it's approaching that six month deadline, right? Um, it's being run like a business, that money's coming from these companies, uh, it's got to change, right? So that, there's one major thing that comes out of this is, uh, he, you know, he's made these accusations. I'd say the people for which these accusations really are directed need to, need to answer. And again, they need to convince us as the public. If, if he's lied, fine, show, show us the evidence. The onus is on them to show us the evidence, right? To me, this guy is correct until proven otherwise, and I haven't seen anybody prove otherwise yet. I think one thing that's definitely happened is COVID has helped, now that it's gone endemic like it always was, to expose the real virus that's always been the long-standing corruption that we know about. And, you know, if we ask ourselves, you know, for a lot of people it's very dim what's happening in our world right now, but if we ask why is this happening to us, uh, you know, someone talked about reclaiming language and replace that with why is this happening for us, it's bringing out team humanity to levels like, you know, with, it's so accessible, we're going to go have drinks with these guys after. Um, it, it's a beautiful thing that's happening right now. There is an enlightenment happening around the world where we are seeing, you know, these lowest common denominator TV shows getting shoved aside by people like these gentlemen, helping to bring truth so that everybody can take stock and, and empowerment in their own lives again so that we can restore democracy the way it should be. So I want to thank these guys. Before I do, though, I'd love to thank um, all the volunteers that came to help my partner, Catherine, for putting me up with me for the last few uh, years now, and then Sherry St. Louis, uh, also Magali Louche. We got Mitch uh, working the camera. And, oh, and I have to say, and Andrew, and thank you guys for filming this. This should hopefully be out within the next week or two. Donate um, to Bright Light News. It's no. important. Thank you. Thanks, Rodney. Uh, and... So I wanted to say, oh, and Jen Lanza was the last uh, volunteer I wanted to thank. But I, again, I want to thank everybody here for coming, everybody for sharing the information that we should all have access to so that we can come to our own conclusions. This is the way we move forward. And I want to thank you guys for everything that you're doing. And, you know, it's humbling that you guys came to join me tonight. So thank you again. So let's hear it for these guys. And I just wanted to say, um, Glenn, I've got to know Glenn, and this is a real man of integrity, and I think he did a fabulous job organizing this, and I think we need to give him a big round of applause. Yeah.